you can be a father when you're 15 years old. Yeah. I mean, biologically, yeah. obviously. Yeah. doesn't require any maturity at all. Right. So uh, that's a different connotation than being a spiritual father, right. which requires all maturity. Yeah, absolutely. To be a spiritual father requires maturity. It requires... You got to have gone through some stuff yeah, you and lived some yeah, life. Yeah, right. You have, to have, you have to have experienced some things. You have to have a maturity even beyond your years where you can see the true essence of a father is he sees the bent, he sees how he can help his child or his son or daughter, however you want to say it. Um, and it's all about them. Nothing yeah. in return. Nothing in return or nothing about him. Mm -hmm. That's the true essence of maturity and being a spiritual father is how can I help you become what God has called you to become? All right. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Leadership in Black and White podcast with John Siebling and Wayne Francis. My name is Parker, and today is a big day because we're launching season two of season two. the we podcast. Season two. We made it. We made it to season two. A uh, huge thank you to everyone who became a listener in our first season of the podcast. We've had listeners from all over the country and even the world and have loved the feedback we've gotten. So thanks for listening, sharing, subscribing, <clears throat> reviewing, all that stuff. Got a great season two planned. Episodes are going to drop around the first week of the month. But if you subscribe on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube or follow on Spotify, the podcast will just show up in your feed. So, Pastor John and Wayne, how are you doing and how do you feel like season one went? I thought it was great. I thought it was great. Just say it. <laughs> I'm doing great. I thought season one was great. Season one was great. We had 12 episodes <laughs> in the book. Now we're going season two, our September episode. We've got a full one. Uh, before we jump into it, though, let's start out with some fun, a tradition on this my podcast. Uh, we always like hmm? to begin with something light. I want my own paper, too. Light, <laughs> uh, before it's very easy to get. <laughs> your own paper. <laughs> We, uh, could, we could get that done this afternoon. <laughs> a little warm up. All right, we're going to play a game called Turn Back the Clock. Oh, gosh. Ooh, turn Back the Clock. New one I made up. It's pretty simple. But you made it up? I, yeah, I just made it up. Turn That's Back great. the Clock is a segment where we go back in time a little bit to learn uh, about you guys. And oh, for this Lord. edition of the game, we're turning back the clock to your school age years. Uh, it is kind of back to school season around the country. Oh, that's Some places, like uh, here in the Mid South, have been going for a few weeks, but I know up in New York, things are getting rolling right Not now. Until next week. Yep. Uh, so I want to quiz you a little bit on your experience with school. A few questions to get started today. Okay, you ready? <laughs> All right. Mm. Very good. First question Let's number go. one <laughs> What was your favorite subject in school? Pretty simple. I don't know. Do you English. 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 Yep. And social studies. In college, my favorite subject was history. Does that count? I don't remember. Sure. <laughs> I have no idea what, in high school, with junior high, what my favorite subject was. I didn't like school. <laughs> so I don't remember having a favorite subject. Okay, what was your least favorite subject? Math. I'm I'm going with, like, chemistry. <laughs> my dad, dad My was dad was a microbiologist, but I did not get any of that genetic yeah. makeup. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a perfect angel and 10 being a borderline criminal, where did you rank in the terms of being a troublemaker? 1 to 10. Uh, 4. Mm, I might have been a 7. Okay. 6. I was an instigator. Okay. I, I'd turn up and then I'd get everybody riled up and then back off. <laughs> back off. So I didn't have to that fight. sounds more like a 5. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Think about kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Is there one year that stands out as like, that was my favorite year in school? Hmm. Eighth grade. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we had a great group of friends. It was carefree. You know, you're at the top of the food chain in middle school. You yeah. haven't jumped to high school yet. High school was a little tumultuous. We moved around. I, I moved high schools uh -huh. a couple of times. So, I'd say 11th grade for me uh -huh. because I had changed schools. I was going to school in the hood and then moved on up to the oh, yeah. east side. And it was such a big transition in my life. I had a great time, 11th to 12th grade. Okay. What is the biggest difference in school today versus when you were in school? If you could pick one thing that's like, this is totally different now. I think that, um, I think that I was probably, there was still a level of some respect for teachers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I, was in, I still had a little bit of reverence for, for a teacher. I think it's much different now. I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, the, 
phones changed everything. Yeah. yeah. We didn't have phones. Now you got to deal with the phone. Those poor teachers yeah, dealing with tough. kids and their phones. Uh, I don't know. This is this isn't a fun. It's deep. This it's is deep. This is not. This is not a. This it's is like, not an ice breaking. Well, I, like, ice breaking type of fun. Like I finished college in 2014, and I always said that I never had to step foot in a library to finish college, and I can't imagine having to spend a bunch of time in. A oh, library. that's actually. I wouldn't even yeah. thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, a couple more. Maybe these will be more fun. On a scale, maybe one we to should ten, ask you these questions. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that's true. Uh, on a scale from one to ten, how popular were you in school? One being no friends at all, ten being king of the school. I was a ten. I, I know that sounds <laughs> so arrogant and stuff like that, but of course. dude, <laughs> of course, we are not surprised. Uh, I think I was probably an eight. You know, awesome. I was really popular, but not. King. Not, king. <laughs> Not like Wayne. That wasn't King Wayne. Uh, okay, last one. Final question. Be honest. What did your average report card look like in school? I was I was in high school, I was two point five. I was a B student in high school. I did much better in college. Mm-hmm. Much, much better. All right, well, there you have it. Good luck to everybody in the school system. Very informative for our listeners. (laughs) uh, Powerful. Shout out to everybody going back to school this year, (laughs) teachers, administrators, all the kids, parents. Yep, Um, it's going to be a good year. All right, let's get into a segment we like to do from time to time called Gray Matter. Mm. Gray Matter is where we talk about things that are gray. Of course, the podcast is called Leadership in Black and White, but the truth is leadership, culture, and everything in life is not always black and white. There are some gray areas. So this segment is a chance to hear John and Wayne talk about current topics that may have some gray and get both of their personal perspectives on them. The goal of the segment isn't to arrive at a correct answer, more to unpack the nuance of each particular topic. And this month... We're going to discuss an issue that both of you have actually been a little bit involved with recently. I I want to get your thoughts on the latest grammatical change the Associated Press made to (laughs) begin capitalizing the B when referring to black people and not capitalizing the W when referring to white people. As you guys have been working on a book that is actually going to be released a little bit later, uh, this is something you learned while working on it, I know. So let me read a bit from the story and then we'll jump in. Uh, The story from the AP says, after changing its usage rules to capitalize the word black when used in the context of race and culture, the Associated Press said it would not do the same for white. The AP said white people in general have much less shared history and culture and don't have the experience of being discriminated against because of skin color. Now, it's become a bit of a debate amongst journalists and scholars. In fact, the National Association of Black Journalists and some black scholars have said white should be capitalized, too. Uh, And interestingly enough, different people have adopted this and some people haven't. For example, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, NBC News, uh, others like that are making that their policy. But places like CNN, Fox News, the San Diego uh, Union Tribune are capitalizing both. And so there's a lot to think about here. The proponents of the decision claim that capitalizing white may give legitimacy to the beliefs of white supremacists Mm. who carry a sort of white pride, while those that don't like the change say keeping white lowercase is actually anti-black, saying it perpetuates the idea that whites are the default race. So maybe some gray area here. What are your thoughts about this? Well, let let me give the backstory. Wayne and I have finished a book called God and Race, Mm -hmm. which comes out in January. And we're excited about it. Maybe you can talk about it in just a second. That'd be great. Um, but so we were reading what's called the galley copy, the um, proof copy. Mm-hmm. And um, or I guess it was actually even before that. They sent the manuscript over. Been, yeah. We were reading the manuscript and it just, I mean, you, you, you get to page three and it stands out. B, B is capitalized, <laughs> black is capitalized, and white isn't. And since the, since the, um, you know, part of the title of the book is, you know, open-handed yeah, conversation about, about race. About race, and it, it doesn't. It didn't seem open-handed. It seemed, um, it, it just seemed odd. Black, capitalized, white, not capitalized, to to both of us. So we, you know, we asked the person that's helping us edit. He said he agreed, and we, you know, sent it back to our publisher with like, hey, we don't think this feels right. And then come to find out that the agent that's helping us said, this is a new standard. The yeah. AP, you quoted that, that, that article, the AP sets the publishing standards and they, 
they always kind of release new rules every year, changes to the rules every year. And everybody, typically everybody follows it. So they were concerned that while, while Wayne and I didn't like it, that the publishers was going to say, this is what, what yeah. we have to do. And it just didn't, it didn't read right. It did. Yeah. It, it read mm-hmm. like. Well, I think I was more concerned about writing a book with you that it's about collaboration and openness and a guide <laughs> It's literally right. called a guide for moving beyond black fists and white knuckles. And I felt like it would trigger white people to not listen to more important matters that we outline no in the book. So for me, it was, I was like, well, if I'm going to trigger you about something, I want to trigger you about something that's going to actually <laughs> lead you to change. Not read capitalization, the rest of, right? Yeah. And not on page three either, where it's like, oh, right. okay, well, this is, I can see some, and it felt reactionary to me because obviously both of us, all of us have read books where... Um, that wasn't the case. And all of a sudden now it's like, oh, okay, well, we see what's shifting in the world. So do you think this is kind of part of the whole woke? Yeah. Wokeism, woke culture that the AP is responding to or publishing? Yeah, publishers? absolutely. And it feels a little bit, to me, it, a little bit disingenuous. And many black scholars actually came out and felt like that was um, the case in point too. So as a person and a person that's collaborating on collaborative race issues, I was triggered mm-hmm. like, I don't want that to represent what we are trying to do. So Right. We want the book to be influential and impact people and yeah. their hearts open to Yeah. Why don't you talk about the book for a moment? I think I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm very excited about our book. It's coming out on January eighteenth. Um, just a few months away. Just a few months away. And we wrote a book called God and Race, Moving Beyond Black Fist and White Knuckles to basically help people become more open-handed with the conversation on race. And again, anything that's going to hinder the conversation, we want to kind of move past. We want to have mm-hmm. something. And so the book, um, I believe, has 14 chapters and you and I go back and forth. It's very practical. So not only is it going to help walk you through how to have tough conversations, which um, I think some of the work allowed us actually to have a conversation like that when we saw that we knew how to we had tools on how to express how we felt about it and it also has a great life group uh curriculum like a companion yeah uh, video curriculum yeah that's that's gonna be even more practical great for churches plug in yep yep so awesome Looking forward to it. It's going to be a great book and interesting conversation. But we're going to take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have a conversation around the subject of fatherlessness and things like that in our society that I think is going to be really insightful. So stay tuned. Sponsored by ARC, the Association of Related Churches. ARC is a tremendous friend of the show, and they are all about launching, connecting, and equipping the local church. If you don't know ARC, you need to know them, whether you're looking for a tribe to connect with, resources to help your church move forward, or considering planting a church, ARC should be your first stop. Check out their website, arcchurches.com, A-R-C-churches.com, for more info and to find out how you can partner with them topic this month is around the subject of fatherhood, fatherlessness, mentors, Mm. raising sons and daughters, and kind of everything that goes with that. It's a little ambitious because it's a big topic, but uh, I know (laughs) it's one that both of you have thoughts about, both are passionate about, and it's actually something we're doing a series on in church right now and sort of sparked this conversation and was maybe even a little bit of the motivation for this podcast. Uh, So let me give you a couple bullet points and then we'll jump in. Uh, Most people believe that this is the most fatherless generation in world history. Mm. Almost 75% of Americans actually said a few years ago that this was the most significant family or social problem facing the country. Right now, uh, about 40% of first through 12th graders uh, in America live with no father in their home. Mm. So that's close to half. Um, We don't have to dive into this, but as you can imagine, a home without a father is tied to a ton of negative statistics, poverty, teen pregnancy, drug abuse, homelessness, homelessness, prison, obesity, crime, all those things increase in likelihood when a father is not present. So it's definitely affecting our society, but it's not just that. Uh, Also, we want to talk about this idea of spiritual fathers and even even mentors. Both of you are pastors. That role is very fatherly, and so many people, even Christians, don't have that sort of role in their Mm -hmm. life. Less than 50% of Christians actually say they belong to a church with a pastor. Uh, And this even translates to the business world. 
a common trend right now among Fortune 500 companies is to develop some sort of mentorship program. Mm. It's very hot right now, and and those that are successful with developing one of these things are seeing the effects. Right. 97% of employees at these companies that have a mentorship program say that a mentor has been helpful. And what's interesting is those with consistent mentors are five times more likely to be promoted and 20% more likely to get a raise. Uh, even more interesting is those who do the mentoring. The mentors themselves report being six times more likely to be promoted. It's almost like that idea of developing leaders and that skill is, is very valuable. But even with all that, all those stats, only 37% of business professionals in America say they have a mentor. So. Sure. I say all that to say, I think we know it's obvious the value of fathers, spiritual fathers, mentors, but there seems to be sometimes a glaring lack of these roles being filled in the lives of people. So let's jump into this topic. We'll kind of just cover a whole lot mm. and, and talk about a lot of different things. Huge but, topic. But do these stats resonate yeah. with you? How big of a deal do you think it is? And why do you think this is such a glaring problem right now? Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all those questions, even at yeah, the end. Sorry, yeah. um, obviously... I think, yes, it resonates. Yeah. Uh, I think when we were prepping, you asked, you know, wh what does that make you think about or how does that make you feel? And I thought about my own dad and I think about my children and I think about uh, Wayne's daughters and I think about, um, you know, other, you know, people in the church who are taking on a role of helping to mentor children who've lost a dad yep. and um, how – yeah, how powerful it is. I mean, yeah. and, and impactful it is. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many. I mean, my mind is going all yeah. over the place. Uh, what do you think? What's your initial thoughts? You it's hear all, definitely not as positive. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, yeah. I yeah. mean, um, yeah. You know, Father's Day is a challenge yeah. in church. Absolutely. Because of the mixed feelings that people have about their dad. And then I think sometimes even the dads come in thinking, man, I'm going to get beat up. I'm going to get beat up today. Yep. Gonna, the sheep are going to get sheared today. But yeah. um, it's a it's a it's an emotional subject. I think it's a challenging. Yeah, because it has implications on how we connect subject. to God, the father as well. Right. And I, I know personally the people that we're leading in churches are people that have extreme absentee relationships with their fathers. And as leaders, it's um, even more pronounced, I think, that um, especially when you have younger staff and you have uh, people that um, have a father wound and you're not aware of it, you figure out things after a while that, oh, this person has a father wound, probably was looking at me in a way that I didn't think, and here I am trying to lead an organization, but there's an emotional piece. So, you know, I feel like I've experienced that. I think I've told you, like, my parents were married um, for 28 years or whatever it is. So I grew up in a home with two parents. It's just that my father was very absentee. And so for me, like a young black man too, I think that's a, one of the reasons why there's lots of gangs and why gangs are effective in primarily black communities. Because of the absent father, you're looking for masculinity someplace else to define and mm -hmm. shape you and you just cluster. So um, my dad was not very affirming. My, my father didn't tell me that he loved me maybe until I was like, I don't know, like, 20 something or whatever. And I remember one time he attempted to when I was graduating high school and it was so awkward. And I was like, I got it, bro. It's good. We I right. don't do it now. You let him off the hook. Yes, like, please stop. Wow. <laughs> don't go any further. But then when I got involved in church circles, and I think my initial relationships with pastors were I was looking for a father. My first pastor was great for a little while. And then he became my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> That's another podcast. That's another podcast. Man, go, go there. <laughs> then I had other pastors that I couldn't tell whether or not they were my boss or my pastor. Mm -hmm. And they toggled in ways that were not definable. So it was tough. And I think as leaders, we have to be very clear about how we're relating to our staffs, or maybe they need to have the weight of a conversation that says, you're going to have to figure out what hat to, to place on. But I, I think 
I had conscious wounds that came from my lack of fathering and then coming into a spiritual context where I'm mm-hmm. either an employee or I'm a church person that just is looking for some sort of fathering relationship that didn't bear out the right way. That's why I think this is an important thing to talk about. Important and difficult to talk about because yeah. of the complexities of it, right? I mean, yeah. you just address all sorts of different things. <laughs> and you could go deeper in each one uh, or, or, or not, depending on how, you know, what direction we want to go. But I think it's a huge subject. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's really three. We kind of talked about maybe three different buckets this subject could address. There's the whole idea of just leading in this fatherless generation. Yeah. We're talking to leaders, and no matter where you're leading, there's a good chance you're leading somebody that's in that category of, of that 40% that's growing up without a without a father. Mm-hmm. And then there's the idea of as leaders, sometimes we are fathers. You are fathers in a pastoral role or even in a business world, a mentor. You play that role. And then there's the third bucket of being somebody that, is being mentored or being led, or I know there's a lot of young people that desire that. Um, in fact, um, I didn't read the statistic, but the millennial generation, it's very, very high on their list of values is having a mentor, hmm. and a lot of them don't have it. Yeah. Um, and so it creates a little bit of a vacuum and a void of like, how do I get this? And so I know that's something we're going to talk about as well. Um, but I think we could go a whole lot of different directions. Maybe just real quick, any general thoughts you kind of touched on a little bit, but just the idea of leading. We're talking to leaders, leading those that are fatherless and how you approach them. Um, you know, this is something that I, I had the thought when you were talking, Pastor Emmy Vasquez, who was, uh, he and his wife Emily were on the podcast a few months ago. He actually addressed this a little bit on that episode about somebody he was pastoring that was viewing him as a father and how it opened up a lot of yeah. wounds and it was kind of a, a messy situation. Do you guys have any thoughts on just advice or, or, or your experience leading in this generation? Do you want to go? Um, yeah, this is a hard. It's, it's, I'm having I'm having trouble con, I'm having trouble connecting because I feel like for me, one of the most important things that I can do is just be myself. Mm. Yeah, and I tend to be a strong mm-hmm. um, a strong leader that has a sense of where I want to go and where I feel like we need to go yep. as yeah. a church as an organization. I feel like I I lead that way and I teach that way the Word of God and I see that, you know, I definitely see that masculinity in in the heart of God our Father and in yeah. how Jesus led and the Apostle Paul. And so I feel like it, I feel like it becomes, uh, I feel like it's, it's natural for me just to, just to lead and just to, to encourage. Maybe, maybe that's just one aspect of, of, of fathering, you yeah. know, but, um, I think more than anything else, I think the church needs leadership. Yeah. And I think that's a real key. Um, and, and, uh, I, I think a lot of people are directionless and need help with, with direction. I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't tend to be super sympathetic. <laughs> I, don't, I don't tend to yeah. be super like, you know, poor you and let me help you sure, overcome yeah. your, um, and, and I'm not saying that's the best. I just feel like that's who I am. And, yeah. um, you know, it's kind of my natural inclination. And, um, yeah, I don't, I, you know, Wayne, I don't know. Wayne, you mentioned your relationship with your father. How do you feel like that shapes your leadership, positively or negatively? What is it, you know? Well, I guess it's done both. Um, I guess it's... Um, it's raised my level of empathy for people because I know what it feels like to not, to not um, be intentionally cared for or Affir- affirmed, affirmed <clears throat> right? Like, you know, Jesus steps on the scene, he's getting affirmation for doing nothing, right? Um, essentially, at least in the scripture, this is my son, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. I feel like it was, it, it made me very thirsty for, like I was telling you when we were in the pre-show, we we're back talking, that my affirmation came from, like, I would save the um, my papers that I would get back from my teacher because he'd write on them, like, you're you're a great writer, you're, you're, you're such a good speaker, or you should be, think about being an actor one day. And it was like, whoa, affirmation, so I would save the, the, the deals because I wasn't getting that. But then I also think that it had, neg- my, my father's absence had, had a negative impact on the way I've led people because sometimes I felt like I needed them to regard me in a particular way for mm-hmm. me to be effective. Mm-hmm. So I needed to, uh, I, 
I, I I needed more of a son and a daughter relationship. And in a church context, it's a hybrid, right? Like yeah. I'm also your boss, right? Right. Um, it's why I feel like there's challenges with language around fathering in church circles. Mm-hmm. That if you're a leader and you're listening, I think we need to address it to a certain degree because we say things like, "Hey, this church, our staff is family." Well, you you don't fire your son, <laughs> you know. Most of the time, it's not like, "Hey, you're fired. You're not my kid anymore," right? Mm-hmm. Like, but. I like the word team better because you can trade and do all that stuff. Yeah, you have a family. Yeah, I have a family, but I don't know if this staff is my family. Right. We have a deep, abiding, godly relationship and a macro level that we're the family of God, but I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. And that's that's probably my father wound. Um, I don't know. I think that's called wisdom because I think at the end of the day, when it comes to our team and when it comes to leading in the church, a lot of a lot of the future is a mystery. Yeah. We, we, even James, we're finishing up the series on James. James talks about don't, you know, don't make any promises about tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I think when it comes to people that are in your life, here's what I've learned. People that are in your life, um, you're not, you're not sure. Are you going to be a father that's just in their life for a season or is it going to be a long-term relationship? Yeah. And sometimes when you, you make the mistake of thinking this is forever. That's when they, that's when they're gone. Yeah. And then if you're not careful, you know, then you can get hard and cynical and not really ever take people into that yeah. personal place. And you look up and they've been there a long, a long time. So I think, yeah. I think that's, that's wise. I, I, I think you, you just don't know. It's a mystery. So you don't know. Team is a great word. Uh, you know, we, we want to function like a family yeah. where there's, Maybe that's a better way. A of good family, it, right? Uh, that's uh, supportive and that's uh, um, you know mutually submitted and and encouraging. Yeah, I think uh, want to function like a family, but maybe it's not the right term for a. Mm-hmm. I do for, think for that staff, pastors, you know, we probably need to. We probably need to increase in this season more of a fatherly posture in some ways. Um, that um, I feel like there might be this kind of. Eugene Peterson would call it like this ecclesiastical CEO kind of nature Mm -hmm. of pastors that are actually turning people off because it feels like you don't have um, a shepherding kind of, Mm -hmm. I think you could be a boss, masculine, strong or whatever, or if you're a female pastor and you're leading and you could be, you know, direct and clear and and making things happen. But I think that there's something that needs to be paternal maybe at times, or you got to know when to turn that on because, um, emotional leadership and being emotionally aware um, helps to inspire people to move to a different level. You know what I'm saying? Especially in a generation that's more brothered than fathered. Mm. So, what do you mean by that, brothered versus fathered? I feel like most of the leaders that are in my age bracket, which would be 35 to, <laughs> to 45, I'm actually outside of it. <laughs> feel pain. I'm getting old. Um, I feel like we're brothered very well, but we're not fathered very well. So we're going to be, and, and that's for two reasons. Now I feel like I just, like I'm, the brother, there's accessibility. So I yep. could talk and, and we could say, hey man, are you staying off, you know, porn sites? Hey man, are you, um, you know, uh, praying? How are you taking care of your family? It's great. And we're mentoring each other and we're giving each other resources and so on. But there's a lack of the senior pastor, the senior leader that's actually concerned about your soul or having conversations with you about your soul or who you are as a, a person or giving access to um, their lives in a different way outside of what I do for you. And so um, a lot of us, I would say, feel like it's very easy to find brothers, supremely hard to find a a spiritual father or mother. So, um, and I, like I told you, I think brothers, brothers challenge, fathers chasten. And there's a, a brother's, the brothers can challenge you to be better and they can challenge you to take it to the next level and read a new book and so on and so on. But you also need, who the father loves, he chastens. You also need this. I, I used to be afraid of going to jail because of my father because my father's <laughs> chastening would have been worse than the jail. But I knew that he was trying. <laughs> he would have been worse than jail. <laughs> oh, 100%. No question. But I knew that he so was trying that to produce. So kept you out of jail. It did. Maybe. It did. It did. Because I feel like he was trying to produce a behavior in me 
epitome of excellence. And although we didn't have a close relationship, I knew the expectation was he had a vision for what I needed to be mm-hmm. like. And I think brothers can't, brothers can't always have a good vision for what you need to be, but fathers can, they could say. Well, if a father is functioning as a father, he's, he's got a maturity that's beyond the function of a brother. A right. brother, you're, you're, you're competing against each other. Yeah. And so there's a certain level of of prodding that you do with each other just by exactly. like, man, you're further th- along than me. How do I get to where you are? And a father, if, 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 if he can function in, 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 in securely, he can be above some of that and just help you process your, true your, your life, you know, true rather than just your vocation. I think some of the fortune 500 stats that you read, the mentoring yeah. is it, it's, it's, it's it's has I think a lot to do with um, personally I think just um, accomplishment. Right. I mean I, I need a mentor because I need to get better at what I do so I can make more money and so sure. I can advance mm-hmm. in my career. Not saying that's bad. I think that's a lot of where the craving is coming from. Yeah. Or the other side of it, just to you know more more affirmation that I'm a good person and that yeah. I'm doing a I'm doing a decent job in my life, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. You know, that, I think a father and a mentor are two different things. True. Yeah, uh, that's true. And and I think a father has to have some level of security to be able to not mm-hmm. take things personally, to encourage, uh, to um, help you see the whole picture, even if the picture maybe. Uh, excludes him to a certain degree. Yeah, you know, that's tough. I mean, there's so many different things that we could talk about. I mean, um, do you think that so, like talking about spiritual fathers now, and, and maybe there's not many people that have a spiritual father, or there's not. Do you think that's a result of not a, enough people stepping into the role of spiritual father, or not enough people seeking out or submitting to a spiritual father? Like, what is it a symptom of more? If you had to guess. I don't know if there's more. More or less, because I feel like it's both, It's right? both. Um, do you have to be a certain age to see yourself as a father, a spiritual father? Maybe. Yeah. So maybe what there's— What is that age? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, you know— t- Some people are old souls. Yeah. I think the, the idea is um, a father—you can be a father when you're 15 years old. Yeah. I mean, biologically, yeah. obviously. Yeah. doesn't require any maturity at all. Right. So uh, that's a different connotation than being a spiritual father, right. which requires all maturity. Yeah, absolutely. To be a spiritual father requires maturity. It requires you got to have gone through some stuff, yeah, you and have, live some yeah, life. Yeah, right. You have to have you have to have experienced some things. You have to have a maturity even beyond your years, where you can see the true essence of a father is he sees the ben- he sees how he can help his child or his son or daughter, however you want to say it. Um. And it's all about them. Nothing yeah. in return. Nothing in return or nothing about him. Mm-hmm. That's the true essence of maturity and being a spiritual father is how can I help you become what God has called you to become, even if that means we're not mm-hmm. together anymore in close proximity. Yeah, yeah, You move yeah, yeah. or you leave or you, uh, and, and right, the mark of a great father is your children aren't still living at your house. They, <laughs> they moved out. So at the end of the day, there is movement that has to sure. happen. Uh, not always the case when it comes to spiritual, spiritual uh, sons and daughters, but um, I just think the essence of spiritual fathering is a high level of maturity and high level of selflessness. And... Uh, not easy, right? My, because my, my. we have human nature and we have a selfish side. And so some of the wounds that you're talking about from spiritual fathers, we've I think everybody's experienced that to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, except Parker, because Parker was born and <laughs> raised the best at the Life Church. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but I can think of stories. We've all been through stories where we've been hurt, wounded by spiritual authority. Yeah, of course. And, uh, man, it's as old as Saul and David, right? It's, yep. it's, um, it's part of it. It's, is it, is it a wound as much as it's discipleship <laughs> as much as it's a good question. training and development and, sure. uh, but you know, tough, tough stuff. I mean, we, you know, I'm, 
This is, this not is a, hitting you different, this, isn't it? This is not a spiritual <laughs> abuse podcast. No, so. okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, there's there's obviously you can hit every caveat. A there's lot so of, many things to talk about. For sure. This could be a four part series. Yeah, when you talk to friends that are uh, around your age, pastors, leaders, who, what are the conversations like? Or what what do they desire? What what do they want when it comes to spiritual authority and fathers and things like that. Definitely think they want clarity and uh, want somebody that's involved in, you know, more than just metrics, but is trying to get them to, I find that people that are like 10 years older than me or 15 years older than me in that generation, they're not very honest. Hmm. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'm, not trying to, I'm just saying. I all, try to general, be, but. but. But I would still say that your, your generation is reluctant to be honest and to, to be, so there's a kind of like, a, you know, a very easy way to talk to people that are in their forties and thirties. I feel like men and women, and cause I don't think it's just men. I think it's also women. They're much more guarded about how they feel and the generation that I'm a part of and that are Gen Z and older require a higher level of transparency. See, I would totally disagree with that. Okay, well, we finally disagree. <laughs> this is about to be a podcast I, now, people, I think, because I we I think g- dishonesty or a lack of transparency has nothing to do with age. You know, well, I, I think it's I, more I know, indicative I have, of age. I could give you stories of people your age, younger. Oh, yeah, that are deceptive. Who, not deceptive, but are unwilling to share the secrets of their heart or the desires of their hmm. heart because they don't want to offend or they're afraid of being controlled. Um, so they're not honest. I mean, I can, we can yeah, talk about. I'm sure we could go both ways, but oh, I would still say, yeah. I do not feel like in a discipleship context uh, with older people, discipling people that are in their thirties or their twenties, that there seems to be more of a transparency in relationship. I'm talking about when me and you have made a decision that we're covenanted to together, it is very one directional. So, and that's a common feeling around people my age. I feel like that's what I've experienced as well. Um, but I've had to, one of the points that I'll talk about later is that I've had to learn to manage my expectations where I don't, I don't need that from you for the relationship to be effective. Mm. It would be nice. It'd be a cherry. But I feel like most leaders that have discipled or mentored me have been one directional. So, and the people that I kind of at least talk to feel like, well, you kind of hold your your, your cards Got close. It. Because for some reason, to be honest and to have authority over a person, it would, the feeling, and I know I struggle with this. I have to consciously tell myself if I'm discipling somebody or raising up my staff, how I can let them feel like they're a part of not only my um, strengths, but the places where I struggle without feeling like if I give you that, I've come down a notch in your life. And I think that that's more of an issue for your generation than it is. Well, I think it's, a, I think it's every generation. And I think it has to do with, with who you feel safe with. Yeah. Okay. You open your heart and you're transparent with people that you feel you can be safe yeah. with. I think that's, that's what, what I was going to say. Do you think it's a result maybe of culture where it's like, there's a lot of distrust in culture and, and, and like, you don't know, how, like, can you trust as you are opening up to somebody that you're leading and vice versa that it's. Yeah. I don't disagree with you that relationships have that level of toggling between like, mm-hmm. can I trust you? It's so on and so forth. I just kind of feel like maybe it's just an observation of the people that I track with or the people that I, or how I look at the world in some ways or something that I would desire personally from, um, a generation or two that's ahead. I feel like people in their 60s and 70s are way more honest about life because they have less to lose. Mm. And I think that people that are 50 and higher and 60, they still shield a lot of stuff. I think with younger people, they can be deceptive or hold their cards. But I feel like the that um, there's a craving for somebody to just say, right. I experience the same thing. Parker and I were having a conversation the other day and I was being transparent with him. Mm -hmm. Honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe more honest than I would have liked to be in that moment. And what did I say? I'm in my feelings right now. Mm -hmm. I'm working through this. I'll get through it. But you need to know how I'm feeling about this right now. Uh, It was not it. It's not like I've premeditated, all right, I'm going to be honest with Parker right now in this, you know, right. or I prepared or I had a written statement. We got into some things and it was, uh, I think it was pretty easy for me to be, uh, you know, there are obviously personal things that I'm not going to share with anybody or share sure. with Parker or maybe just my wife or whatever. Um, 
being transparent is a challenge for anybody, I think. And it yeah. depends on if you feel safe with the person that you're being transparent with, I feel like. Uh, because hmm. otherwise, um, you, so can get, how did you can you, get yourself in trouble being transparent with the wrong person. 100%. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's just a, right. across the board. But when I think about the relationships that, that I've thrived under in a professional setting, yeah. like secular context, um, a boss, mm -hmm. or a church context, or even in my natural context with my father in a natural sense, I always felt like I grew where there was more vulnerability or where there was more, hey, let's learn this together as opposed to it being one directional. So 100%. did you feel you felt more alive because Pastor John was kind of like letting you into space sure. that was not predictable, right? It wasn't like, hey, we're going to have a talk about, sure. you know, what I'm working through. It just kind of happened. And I think the the challenge here for being really good leaders in this spot of uh, life that we're in right now is knowing when to turn that piece on. That was a gift that you gave him. But there's a lot of people that are not, including, you know, myself, that have to be a little bit more intentional about realizing we are pastoring people and leading people that need some sort of father ethos. To well, I'll be honest, impress. in the middle of that conversation and even at the end of it, I wondered if I'm going to regret this conversation because... He already told me everything, so you should... No, just <laughs> and he can tell you everything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me because um, it wasn't like deeply personal, it but it was... Webs. He knew... It, it gave him insight into, you know, yeah. how I was feeling. When, when I say I, I regretted it in the middle of it, not deep regret, but I wondered, was it constructive? My honesty and my transparency as a father to him, was it a constructive thing? In other words, did it help him grow? Right. Yep. Uh, maybe it helped him see the humanity side, but he sees it every day because yep. we work together every day and he knows I'm not perfect. So uh, I, think, I think what I'm not going to try to... Um, I'm not going to try to reword what you're saying because I think you've said it well, but I think what people need to see, and I like to see it as well, is um, honesty about your struggles and the things that you're walking through in your yeah. life and how you have maybe made mistakes and, and overcame them or, or, or working through things right now in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, is that what, I, is yeah, that what a, you're saying? That is that 100%. the kind of, yeah, because I think that's that reaffirm. That, that reassuring side and that refreshing side of, wow, okay, if he's dealing with those yep. emotions or things. When I was in a corporate space, I was the president, I was the assistant to the president of the tea association in New York City. And um, my boss was a very, he was brilliant, like one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my entire life and verbose and well-spoken and well-traveled and all that stuff. But he would create opportunities where I would hang out with him and his wife, me and my wife and stuff like that. Or he would bring me into certain meetings that were above my pay grade right. to show me a context or he would be like, like stupid things that he didn't need to do. He'd be like, hey, just come into this meeting and take minutes because I really didn't belong in the meeting. But he'd say, hey, come take minutes. I don't even know how to take official minutes. You know what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> just scrambling. <laughs> scrambling stuff. I'm looking at my watch. I'm taking minutes like this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so amazing for him to talk about things that he was struggling with on a professional level or here's, you mm -hmm. know, the challenge of um, having, you know, college age sons and I, mm -hmm. I have this amount of work time that I have to do. It was great. So anyways. How do you blood. draw, how do you think you draw that transparency? Like from the other side, so you're not the leader, you want the transparency from a leader. How do you get to a place where you could pull that out of them because I think obviously I think at the root of it it takes a long time to get to it a place does. where that can even happen you definitely don't say I need you to be more transparent with me <laughs> yeah, you'll like, scare them away yeah, in no, a, <laughs> yeah I'm not doing that I'm not doing that um uh, we can get into some of this no, stuff we can later. save it if it's on yeah, your yeah, list yeah we'll save it till I, later but, yeah but yeah just curious because I think I think it's a, a it's easy to desire that but it's another thing to put yourself in a position to receive it I, yeah, exactly. You know, I've been kind of wrestling down. Like, Interesting. Everybody can have a boss, but not everybody can have a pastor. And I've, I've been trying to, and I guess everybody could have a pastor if they wanted to. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what the hybrid of that is effectively in our church scaling culture. Because I encounter more and more people with personal 
father wound pain on on staffs and people that mm. I have led over the last decade. It's crazy. That's a yeah. That's an interesting question. We'd have to unpack it further. I think to <laughs> maybe maybe one more question in this category, and then we'll take a break and, and move on to something else. How how do you think as you guys are leading organizations? How do you create a culture, or any thoughts on how to create a culture where development and discipleship and mentorship is sort of happening organically? Mm. Just something that's because mm. you know, obviously you guys can't father and disciple and lead every single person. It's not realistic. Even Jesus, he has right. 12 disciples. He had a smaller group. How do you create the layers of that in an organization? Um, my buddy Grant Skeldon says mentorship is adding someone to your calendar, but discipleship is including someone in your calendar. And that mm. churches and organizations that thrive are the ones that figure out how to keep including people in something that's already moving instead of adding things and mentorship programs. And, mm. you know, you, you know, this, you and I are going to do this at this time. It's like creating a culture. I mean, I feel like we've done that here. We have life leadership and we have some systematic things that you can get involved in that are already going in the church thing. It's not like we're adding something on. It's already something that you could plug into. I think it has to be, that's what you just, you just said, I'll say it in another way, systematic and organic. Sy right. Systematic is the life leadership and the classes and discovery and the, yep. uh, the organic piece is including other people on the journey and bringing other people into meetings or getting people involved in things that um, they don't necessarily need to be involved in, but it maybe will let them see you, a part of you, and it will allow them to grow. Yep. And I think Jesus did this mm -hmm. masterfully when you read. He brought certain people with him, and he went True. to certain places. And even in the Old Testament, it talks about, you know, how you parent, how you raise up your your children, right? You talk to them along the road, right? And, you know, that whole yep. passage where it, it's much more about doing it in the course of life than it is about, sitting down and having, you know, I'm going to sit down and mentor you now. I'm yeah. going to sit down and disciple you yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just much more organic how you, you watching how somebody handles the situation and how yeah. something happens in a, in a functional moment, you yep. know? Yep. Okay. We could talk about a lot of different stuff and keep going, but we're going to take one more break and hear from another one of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to get practical and do a little more practical we'll stuff. We're going to get into so, lists. Uh, yeah. Stay tuned. Today's episode is also sponsored by WIF, the Wesleyan Investment Foundation, a phenomenal organization that both Pastor John and Wayne have worked with. Their primary purpose and operations are providing loan assistance to churches and church-related entities so they can expand their facilities, purchase land, build, renovate, or refinance current debt. For more information on how you can partner with them, check out wifonline.com, W-I-F-online.com. All right, welcome back. Let's wrap up this month's podcast by getting practical. The last segment was a little more organic, conversational. Now we're going to get practical. We love lists, so yes. we got a couple lists. I love lists. Right. Pastor John yeah. especially. Wayne likes his list, too. They just I threw out a little alliteration today. Yeah. But, uh, so what do you have for challenge this month? Challenge or chase it. Yeah. Chase Brothers Jason. challenge. That's right. <laughs> Father Jason, That's let's right. go. Pastor Wayne, what list have you put together for us? I have a list of how to attract a mentor or mm. spiritual leader, whether you're a female or male. I think this will be relevant to you in your organization, particularly in church, mm. um, which we obviously are church leaders. So number one, um, be a value add, not just a time add. I think that people, most of us are willing to mentor, develop, and try to you know bring somebody along. But I think that if you want to be a person that's attractive, you want to be a person that adds value to whatever context that you're in with a senior leader. It could be as small as you become an expert in a particular thing. It's sort of like Brad Hampton. Shout out Brad Hampton. Brad Hampton can attract high level leaders because he's become an expert in a particular area. He's a value add so that if you ask, if he asked you to be involved in a meeting or something, you know, you're going to learn something, you know, mm. it's going to grow your team. It's going to do something. So if I'm going to explain, if I'm going to attract a spiritual father, a leader, a mentor, a spiritual mom, whatever, be a value add. Bring something that actually helps that person scale in their capacity. There's another way to say it. Make sure that as they invest in you, they know that you're going to do something yes. with the investment. Is that the same thought? Yes, absolutely. Thought? Too. Like, yeah. like you don't want to waste your time mentoring somebody that's not going to take yeah. and move, move yeah. their life forward. Okay, It's like both. Yeah. Both deals. Reduce okay. number two. Reduce your options. I think um, in a culture where there's tons of options 
it is very easy for people to be unfocused. They need too many things. Mm. You're you're needing too many different types of mentors or a spiritual father. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. I think you need to reduce your options and take the time to do that. It took me nine years to find you as my pastor Mm. and I didn't rush because I had some bad experiences and then I had to start thinking of a criteria, a rubric of what I was looking for in pastors before I talked to you and Pastor Leslie, which was also managing my expectations saying, I I want a pastor and it'd be great if they can father me or father us, but I'm, that's not the expectation. The expectation is for me to grow spiritually, to have spiritual covering and to be submitted to somebody that I am willing to say, Everybody else doesn't matter as much as you. Mm. Now, that doesn't negate the fact that I have mentors and some people that can add value to me, but I've reduced my options to one. So I think that's a huge, huge deal that before you get to the place where you're going to ask somebody something, reduce it down to a rubric, come down with what you need from a person so that you could um, find that person instead of getting many to scratch every single itch that you have inside of you. That's great. Make sense? Yeah. Number three, articulate what you need specific growth in. This is another focus thing. It feels a little bit redundant, but if you're going to seek a, a spiritual father, a mentor, or so on, you should probably get under somebody that you're trying to um, address a specific uh, growth area. If you're a professional, there's a lot of Mm -hmm. different things that you could go go on in that area. For me, it was sort of like I needed to, and for my wife and I, to be under a context where I could grow holistically in the area of leadership, like church leadership, staff leadership, growing a church, and so on. And of course, you and Pastor Leslie were attracted about that, but I had made a list of what I needed before I even met you. So it was agnostic to whether or not it was you and Pastor Leslie. It was like I knew exactly what I'd be willing to burn the plows for if I found that person. Mm. Then the last thing is in is manage your expectations. Your senior leader does not have to be your father and mother all the time. They need the freedom to put on that hat when they need to. And that's more than enough. A lot of times I think um, you don't need the frequency of a father that's calling you every day. And it, it's not, that's not it. You you need the capacity to be able to have fatherly or motherly conversations at specific times. They don't have to be the person that's nurturing you all the time. So it's my responsibility mm-hmm. before I get into a relationship with a person to manage my expectations, because guess what? all of our expectations get hurt or blown out of proportion at times or Mm -hmm. we're all fallible. But if I can manage them, like, especially if you're a wounded person. So for instance, like when we decided to ask you and Pastor Leslie to be our pastors, first of all, I kind of, I talked to Pastor Dino, shout out Ark, Pastor Dino Rizzo, let's go. (laughs) Um, And and asked some questions, kind of interviewed him about you because I knew Mm -hmm. that you guys were close. But I had to make a decision that I think potentially the both of you could provide that for me, but I'm not going to expect it. Maybe it's a protection thing. Like, well, I don't want to get hurt, but I also want to be effective for you Mm. because the relationship is not just about what you're giving me. Again, I'm going back to, I'm here to add value to you, to help you be a better leader, to help you reach your dreams that are apostolic. So when I manage my expectations, I bring value. And for some mystical reason, you also get value back as a result. Mm. So that's my list. Hey, we could take that same list. Go back <laughs> let's, and let's flip it. Let, before we get to my list, let's flip it and say, that's what to, so the other side of it is, as a father, a spiritual father, what's the first one? Don't be, be a value add, not just a time add. Okay, so that's got to be what a spiritual father has to commit to or yeah. a mother. All right, so right. Um, make sure that we're spending time together. I'm adding value to you. Right. Um, if it's just my thoughts, if it's my stories, if it's yeah. my time, if it's yeah, my yeah, yeah. encouragement, if it's, okay, let's break down a problem you're dealing with right now. Let me give you my insight. But, right, so yep. spiritual fathers need to have have a value yeah. add. What's the uh, second one? Reduce your options. Like, yeah, I mean, I think part of that whole idea of, of, of you know, you, you brought it from the other context, but 
um, when I'm with you, you're, you know, we're together. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, reducing other options. And it's like, it's, it's what I mentioned during the break. We talked about the fact that a good father needs to, needs to have uh, a commitment to diversity. And so the last thing I want to do is as a, as a spiritual father with you, Wayne, is turn you into me. Right. How many fathers are trying to really that is, a good point. get their sons and daughters to just be them and yeah. to act like them? And, and you know, you and I are so different, different in personality, different in what what lights us up and what, yeah. um, uh, you know. So the last <laughs> thing I would want to do is tone you down or, or you know, turn you, in, turn you into me. That would be a disaster. So, uh, you know. That's important. <laughs> yeah, All that's right. a big deal. What's the next one? Uh, the um, um, articulate what you need specific growth in. So I think um, you you articulated. I also need to maybe be willing to be honest. Yeah, and say, okay, you may think this is where you need the growth, but this is really where you need the oh, growth, yeah. and that requires. Yeah. We've had those conversations. Th- yeah, those are those are challenging <laughs> on both sides, but as a, as. A, if you want to be a spiritual father, if you want to be a leader, a mentor, there's no way you can do it if you're not honest. Mm-hmm. There's no way you can do it if, you, if you're not. You say transparent earlier, but uh, um, honesty from, from my perspective or from that perspective. And then the last one is manage your expectations, yeah. which I think is, Im- I mean, you could reverse. Read, read the, 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 the words that you said underneath that. Um, some, your some senior leader me. doesn't have to be your father and mother all the time. You don't need a lot of frequency from your father. Okay, you just so, need and times. I, and I would say, like, now having, like, I'm going to use a correlation for my own children who are basic, we're basically empty nesters now, <laughs> right? So um, it's, it's, sometimes I feel like with my children, I don't want to always be, I don't always want to be sending them notes. Yeah. Right? Because I I want I want to make sure that they don't feel like they're kind of hearing from me all the time and this and that or whatever. So sometimes I think the expectation is the is the other way too, where you press into this, you Mm -hmm. press into the your mentor, you press into Mm -hmm. your spiritual father and mother. Yeah. Um uh, and it's okay, it's okay to do that. Maybe that's what they that's what they need more than you're waiting for them to send you a note and ask you how you're doing. Maybe they're waiting for you to send them a yeah. note and ask how they're doing. And a sign of maturity of a son or a daughter who's growing up is they're not just sending you a note when they need something. Right. They're sending you a note to say, hey, how you doing today, Dad? Absolutely. How you, you know, like, so yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of like, anyway. Yeah, I think that's great. You can take my list and flip it to you. <laughs> I'll plan it to. My, 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 my list is... Um, my list is really a two, two, two pastors to see themselves as spiritual fathers and mothers. Wow! Like I think you have to make that decision. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna act like a father. I'm not gonna act like a, just like a brother. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to act like a father. I, I, and I quote the same verse that my thing's messing up here. I quote the same verse that um, that you quoted, Wayne. That. Um, Though you might have 10,000 instructors, you, you don't have many fathers. Here's what the message says. The message says there are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong, but there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. Yeah. That's the message translation. Yeah. So what if we saw ourselves, I'm, I'm talking to pastors now, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but CEOs as well, business, sure. uh, business owners and business leaders as well. What if you saw yourself as a, as a, as a father, you know, um, the culture of the, the, the coaching profession, if you think about this, Wayne, yeah. um, is you, when a coach is coming up, you know, like yeah. a, a good assistant coach, the, the head coach knows I only have a certain amount of time with this, yeah. this guy because yeah. they're going to get pulled. Yeah, you know, they're going to get. So if you kind of saw like yourself as, as a father, you know, I have. I can do as much as I can right now to help you become the best that you can be because I don't know how long, how long, or yeah. what, what's and and that's the same for our for us as natural fathers as well, right? Our children grow yeah. up and they they, they move out, right? They they go to college, <laughs> right? Married. You just drop one off at college. Mine, yeah. I have one about to get married, um, and so to really see yourself in a as a father, yeah, 
and I'm going to say mother too, but I know we're talking about yeah. fathers and Wayne and I are men, and you know, so yeah. there is a there is a father position, yeah. there is a mother position, but. Um, so some tips. All right. Here's my list. I got eight. They're fast. Let's go. I'll go through them quick. First of all, it's just a genuine desire to see young men and women grow in life and ministry. Mm-hmm. You got to have that desire. Mm-hmm. Some people don't have that desire. They're yeah. just trying to build an organization. Right. And I think you got to put that hat on and you got to say, I want this young man, this young woman to grow in life, yep. and to succeed and do well. If she wants to be a teacher, I want her to be the best teacher. And I want her to remember at some point in her life what she learned by being a part of our our, our, our ministry. Number two, a willingness to give away ministry. Hmm. Okay. A willingness to give yes, away some of the preaching, gross. Yeah. some of the leading, some of the decisions. How do you grow? Yeah. Unless you're the one sitting at the table and everybody's looking at you yep. and saying, what are we going to do? And you have to yeah. decide that's a different seat to be in. Yep. Uh, but you don't learn and you don't grow unless you're given responsibility. Number three, make room at the table. It's similar to number two, but make room at the table for ideas and decisions and, mm-hmm. you know, even the look and the feel of ministry. Let 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 a 15 or 16 year old uh, walk around and tell you what they think about the discovery room. Yeah. Does it feel stuffy? Does it feel old? Does yeah. it feel... Uh, number four is clear communication. You talked about this encouragement and correction. I think clarity is important. I think honesty clarity. is important. I think it's okay to be honest. It's okay to put your feelings out there. Wayne doesn't feel like we're doing it enough, but we're trying, Wayne. <laughs> we are trying in our generation to be honest. <laughs> uh, it's a goal. It's on my list. Number five, uh, access to you. You know, give young people in, now specifically. This is like. We're talking about teenagers and young people yeah. and young adults in yeah, your yeah, church. Yeah. Let them be around you. You know, our, yeah. we've always said our green room is a uh, is a an open. It's a, oh, it's, yeah. it's open. Yep. And and just yesterday we were having a meeting. I don't know if you remember this. We were preparing, getting ready for encounter night. Mm-hmm. It's me, you, and Johnny. I mean, we're looking yep, over yep. the list, and and Adams. Yep. Grayson walks right up. I mean, I don't know how old Grayson is, but he's my first he's my buddy. And <laughs> and uh, he didn't care that we were having a meeting about encounter night. And I didn't care that he walked right up and <laughs> gave me a high five and was looking around. And, you know, uh, he was up in the meeting, you know, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, I, I love that about, you know, obviously there's not 50 kids in the right. green room running around. But, uh, you, you know, so there's some practical side to this, but access Number six, be transparent and real. Yeah. As a leader, like young people can smell fake. If you're faking, oh, uh, it gets smelling. It's worse. Yeah. It's, it's worse than you know than anything. I think number seven, give people, uh, give young people real responsibilities in serving, and then and then number eight, this is the hardest thing, but to release young people when they need to be released, hmm. when God calls them somewhere else. Yeah. Especially people, I'm thinking Wayne of people that have grown up like in church, and you know, yeah. then they feel like, well, I, it's, um, they've grown up in your church, or you've had a hand yeah. in mentoring them, and then all of a sudden they're like, well, I, we feel like God's moving us here, and it's like, ah, oh, you know, it hurts. Yeah, it's not easy. Oh man, I hate it. But to do it in a loving way, because it's not necessarily that something's wrong with you, right? It's just that there's something out there that they, they need to go explore. Yeah, you gotta, and what are you going to do when you're 19, 20, 21, 22? You go 25, whatever the age is. Yeah. Go go explore and go say yes to, you know, do it with the right, in in an honorable way. I mean, yeah. that's for another episode. Uh, leave in the right way. Leave with, with, with honor. Uh, but you as the father, you got to keep that right spirit. Hmm. You got to keep that right spirit. You know, you know um, uh, uh, that's a great list too. The last piece, which I think is interesting, we didn't get to say this, and I know we're wrapping up here, but um, I think that there's something to say in my list and, and joining this together that as a, if you're in the role of a son or a daughter, <laughs> thank you. There's my list in case you, in case you <laughs> want to reverse it. Like I reversed yours. I didn't mean to reverse yours and no, take it's over. I just, you know. no, it's all good. Um, if you're a son or a daughter, you know, um, you tell your brothers what you're going to do. You ask your fathers what you can do. And I think that... You should. You should. Right. Like, you you ask your dad, can I go to college? Uh, you know, I, and I'm thinking about going over here because he's going to pay for it, right? The, right, fa- right? the prodigal son didn't go back to his brother's house. His brother was still living at, at home. 
And I think that there's something that we just have to say about a culture of this sort of, in our generation, I'm speaking about this very easy way of just making decisions without inclusion of your That's the hardest thing cover. for That's the hardest that's thing for a father. 100%. The hardest thing in the world. You can make a decision. I'm okay with you making a decision that I might not even like, but at least include me in the process. And then you might get, you know, blessed later on. <laughs> but anyways... I, yeah. I just wanted to riff on that a little something. You did great. You know, Good thank job. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, final segment for today's episode is our closing question. Mm. And this month's closing question is sponsored by Hand of Hope. Thank you, Hand of Hope. Hand of Hope is the missions arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, mm. and their goal is simply to help as many hurting people as they possibly can to alleviate human suffering and to help Christians grow in their faith. We partner with Hand of, Hand of Hope and David Meyer, and they're doing some incredible work. Even right now, they're bringing relief in Afghanistan, Haiti, Middle mm. Tennessee, Louisiana, uh, they're quick yep. to respond to pretty much every opportunity that pops up to serve. And yes, they're phenomenal. Disaster relief, yeah, is absolutely, excellent. yep. Phenomenal organization to support financially, but even to partner with for outreach and world missions. They do a lot of really cool things, and we've worked on them with some pretty awesome projects. So you can find out more about what they do and how you can partner with them by going to joycemeyer.org slash hand of hope, joycemeyer.org slash hand of hope. Thank you, Hand of Hope, for being a partner of the Leadership in Black and White podcast. Our closing question this month, true or false, it is never a good idea to respond to negative comments on social media. <laughs> true or false? Say it again. <laughs> True or false, it is never a good idea to respond to negative comments on social media. I would say true. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. I think you are, um, the, the, the goal of those negative comments is to pull you into an argument. And 100%. I have never seen anybody look real good doing that. You don't win in the comment section. I think you look, you end up looking weaker and worse and defensive. And, mm. you know, I can just picture you behind the scenes sweating and getting angry and, you <laughs> yeah. know, ma making those comments, right. arguing back and forth. But I know some people real, feel real passionate, like I got to stand up for myself and, mm. you know, but. I also think if you have to, it'd be better to ask a question. Mm. So if somebody's coming at you in the comments, just ask a question because it'll neutralize you a little bit. Yeah. And it'll give you some room. <laughs> you don't agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But my tendency is to ask a question like, okay, well, you know. What about this? If you go further with it, is it better? <laughs> you, you and I talked about this one time about a, a post. I said, well, let's just do it where you can't turn the comments off. And you're like, no, no, you look, you look. Yeah, oh, yeah. You, you look, look you teddy. Look, you look bad. If yeah. You, <laughs> like say whatever you want in the comments, but I'm not turning off the comments. <laughs> Well, we didn't do it, by the yeah, way. Yeah. But you look a little scared. You look a little scared. Scared of cat. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody, to this month's episode of the Leadership in Black and White Season podcast. Two, Season episode two. One. Episode one. Off and running. You can follow us on Instagram at Leadership in Black and White. And uh, stay tuned for more episodes. But until is, is season two going to be better than season one? Oh, yeah. 100%. That's, that's yes. what I thought we're you'd gonna say. We're going to say yes. Yeah. It's going to be better we're gonna, for sure. But what we're going to do is we're going to under promise and over deliver. <laughs> okay. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next time. This month's episode was produced by myself, Parker Van Blaricom. Video and audio editing were done by the Life Church creative team in partnership with Younger. Music used throughout the episode, and the song you hear right now is from local Memphis, Tennessee artist Jordan Occasionally. Remember, if you haven't already, do us a favor and like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.